Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome to the video, Affinity Photo for Beginners. If you're brand new to Affinity, this video, uh, get cozy, will be perfect for you. If you're coming over from Photoshop, uh, hi, nice to see ya. Uh, this video will be perfect for you. If you came across this video by mistake, not sure how, somehow, some way, figure it out, this video will be perfect for you. Now, if you don't know what Affinity Photo is, it is a fully functional photo editor comparable to, and if you ask me, and I think you did, Photoshop, and better in some ways. So let's jump right in, and let's get started by creating a new document. So, you create a new document, you wanna go up to File, and then select New. Now when you do that, you're gonna get this new document window. Now on the left-hand side, Affinity has just created some uh, common sizes that you can just pick and just start working on them. Things to note on this page are if you wanna change your document from landscape to portrait, the option is right up here. And you'll see I have a preview window or you have a preview window on the right-hand side here. And if I go between portrait and landscape, you can see it flip back and forth there. If you wanna create a document your own size, you can just go pick any document and under page width and height, you can change that. Right now we're set to pixels and I could pick whatever, 2000 by 4000. And when I do that, you'll see in the preview window, it'll change. Uh, so those are my settings to change that. I could change from pixels to something else if I wanted to pick another document unit. And I could also change my DPI down here, um, my dots per inch, depending on what I was working on. Um, another thing to note here under the color tab is if you wanna start your document with a transparent background, you can just click this box. And to know it's transparent, you'll see there's no background on this document by this checkerboard. That indicates that there is no actual background on it and it is transparent. You could also change your color format uh, here from RGB to CMKY. If you ever need to do that in the future, it's under your color tab. And you also can change your margins. Uh, one last thing to note under here is you can create your own setting, your own preset by going to this bottom in the bottom left here and saying uh, add new preset. Now for to get started, all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick FHD 1080 and select landscape. There's no wrong answer here. You can pick whatever you want and then just click create. Okay, so this is our workspace. Now don't let this overwhelm you if you're brand new to it. I'll break all this down. We're gonna break it into four pieces. Now on the far left side, we're gonna have our tools. In the middle, we're gonna have our canvas. On the far right, we are going to have our panels, including our layers and some of our effects. And the very top, we are going to have our uh, refinement toolbar. So let's start on the very left with our tools. Now just think of these just like that. This is a toolbox. You'll go over here, you'll grab a tool, and when you're done, you'll go grab another one. Now, if you put your mouse over top of any of these tools, it'll tell you what the tool is, and in brackets, if there's a shortcut, it'll tell you uh, how to get to it on your keyboard. So this happens to be the move tool. Uh, I could click on it, or I could just hit V on my keyboard, and it would flip to that tool. If I go down, the color picker tool, the selection brush tool, same thing there. Another thing to note about this toolbar over here, or for the tools, is some of them you'll notice have a little uh, triangle in the bottom right corner. Now, if I click on this little triangle here, what that means is there are more tools in here. Now, Affinity has put them together on purpose. They've grouped them together because they're the similar, they're similar or they work well together. So they've added more tools in that way. So if you see a little triangle in the bottom right corner, that means there are more tools. Now, in the middle section here, this is your canvas. And think of it just like that. Whatever you create, whether it's a picture or it's a drawing or it's art or text, whatever you export, however this looks is how your document is going to look. So this is just your main canvas. Over on the far right side here are your panels. So up here you see you have little tabs called layers, channels, brushes. Uh, down at the bottom you have masks and effects and we'll go over all that stuff. But these are your panels, which you'll use a lot. And these can be configured any which way as well. But they are uh, your colors up here as well. So it's an important part. And at the very top, is your uh, refinement toolbar. And I'll show you what I mean. If I go back to my tools here and I click on it, if you look at the very top, you'll see the option changes up here. And if I go to the next tool, it'll change again. If I go to the next tool, it'll change again. And think of this essentially as you're refining a tool. I could take a paintbrush and I could say, okay, I have my paintbrush selected, but now I want to make it bigger or I want to make it smaller so I can refine it up here. I've just made it bigger or I can use this slider. I can make it smaller. So just, just think of it as you grabbing a tool and then really dialing in how you want the tool to work by using the refinement toolbar at the top to really uh, narrow it down. Now, one last thing to note about this interface is this can be configured whichever way you want. So I can grab this layers panel over here on the far right. I can drag it out and I can move it over here and I can clip it into something else over here. Now, sometimes you'll do it by mistake and you're like, oh, I didn't mean to do that or where did it go? I'll go through this a couple times in the 
video, but you can always reset your studio back to default in case something gets you know, lost or you close something and you don't know where it went. And you can always do that by going up to Window, Studio, and Reset Studio. And when I do that, everything pops back into place and goes back to normal. So that's your interface. Let's go on to the next section. Okay, so the next thing that we're gonna talk about is placing a photo. So if you have an existing photo you wanna work with and you wanna bring it to Affinity Photo, there's a couple different ways to do this. I'm gonna explain the most basic way, um, but there's just note there is a couple ways to do this. So uh, what you're gonna do is you're gonna go up to File, and then you're gonna go down to Place. And when I do that, your computer is gonna say, okay, you wanna bring a file in, where's the file? My photo happens to be right here, but you can browse to wherever your file is on your computer, and then just click Open in the bottom right corner. Now, when I do that, you'll see the photo doesn't appear, but my mouse changes to this little arrow that's pointing down. And basically it's saying, hey, click and drag out where you want your photo. So I'm gonna go to the top right corner. I'm gonna click, I'm gonna drag it out to about here. And I can just use, with the move tool select, I can just move this around um, how I want. And you'll see these red and green lines appearing, which are just guides telling you, hey, this is in the center in the middle, this is centered here. And this photo looks okay for this canvas, but maybe I don't want this white space here and I wanna crop the photo. So I'm gonna to explain to you how to crop it really quickly. So because a crop is a tool, we're gonna go over to our tools in the far left corner here. And the crop tool is right here. So if I put my mouse over it, I can either click on this or hit C on my keyboard. I'm gonna click on that. Now I have these options, this little grid pops up with these little nodes in the corners. You see one here and one here. And what I can do is just grab these arms, these little nodes and just pull them over to about where I want. So say I wanna go here and I wanna go here cause I wanna get rid of the white space. And then to commit this, I can either go in my top left corner and click on apply, or I can just hit enter on my keyboard. So when I do that now, my photo is now uh, perfectly cropped the way I want with everything in it. I don't know who this obnoxious person is with all these pencil crayons around their computer. They look a bit sloppy if you ask me, but that's another story. Um, one more thing to note while we're in here is if I wanna zoom in or zoom out on this photograph, uh, on a Mac, I would hit Command plus to zoom in or Command minus to zoom out. On a PC, it would be Control plus to zoom in or Control minus to zoom out. And I'll throw that up on the screen so you can see it. So that is bringing in a photo. Again, there's a couple different ways to do it, but the easiest way is to go File, Place, find the photo under your computer where it is, select it, hit Open, and bring your photograph in. All right, next. Okay, so now we're gonna be talking about adding text in Affinity Photo. So text is a tool. So we're gonna go over to our toolbar and our text is right over here. Now you'll notice with this particular tool, it has one of those little triangles in the bottom right corner. So if I click on that, you have two options, the artistic text tool and the frame text tool. Now your artistic text tool is for things like headlines, uh, larger text, titles, and the frame text tool is for uh, more text, like paragraphs or more sentences, things like that. So let's click on the artistic text tool first. When I do that, my mouse is gonna change to an A with a target. And the way you add text is you just click hold and just drag your mouse out to whatever size you want. So I'm just gonna go to about here and I'm gonna type in design method. And it's a little large. So what I'm gonna do is go back to my move tool. I can also click V on my keyboard. And I'm just gonna adjust it by grabbing these nodes in the corner here. And you'll notice in the refine toolbar at the very top, if I move this text, the number changes. So I could also click in this box and I could type a number or I could grab these nodes and just change it back and forth. Uh, and adding or uh, changing your font and all that stuff is very similar to Microsoft Word or email or anything like that. You just go up here and you'd select a font and a font size and if you wanted it bold or italic or regular. So pretty standard there. So that is the artistic text tool. If I go back to my text tool, click on the little triangle here. And this time I pick the frame text tool. My mouse is gonna change to a T with a target. And when I click and drag out, I'm gonna get this box and I can adjust it to whatever size I want. But basically Affinity is saying, draw out a box and you can put whatever text you want in that box. So from here I could type, I could cut and paste text. And what I'm gonna do right now is just add filler text, which is essentially just gibberish to show you what happens with the box when you add a bunch of text. So to add filler text, I'm gonna go up to text, insert filler text. And when I do that, you'll see the box is now full of text. And if I move the box around, the text will mold to that box. So whatever I add, however I do it, if I move the box around, the text is kind of kind of flow with it. So that's something to know about the artistic and frame text tool. So adding text, again, just a tool, uh, artistic text tools for titles, frame text tool is for paragraphs and longer sentences. Let's move on. Okay, so next up, we're gonna talk about adding shapes 
and changing colors. And changing colors applies to text as well. It's just a little bit easier to show it with shapes. So let's go over to our tools and we'll look for our shapes. Now, right now mine is a square. And you'll notice again with this tool, if I click on the little air triangle in the bottom right corner, there's a whole bunch of pre-set uh, shapes that Affinity has created for us. Now I'm just gonna pick rectangle. Now something to know with your shape. Now I've got a square or rectangle selected. And if I just click and drag out, I can just make my shape, right? So I can make a rectangle or a square. And something to note when you do this, if you create a shape and you hold shift, so I'm gonna go back to my shapes. And this time, let's say I'm gonna pick a circle. If I hold shift while I drag this out, it'll make it perfectly proportional. So it'll stay in perfect shape from top to bottom, no matter how big or small I make it. If I let go of shift, my circle will start to do this. So to keep it totally proportional, you can hold shift and it won't change, or you can let go of shift and make it kind of whatever shape or whatever, uh, whatever shape you want, essentially. So I've got these two shapes here. They're both set to blue. Now to find your color, your color is in two different spots. It's in the top right corner here. It's also in the bottom left. I don't like to use the one in the bottom left personally because all my color controls are up here in the right. Now, the important thing to note here, I'm gonna select this circle. There's two, there's actually three circles here you're saying. Now this circle, this big circle that's a little bit lower than this circle is your fill color. So if I move this color around, you're gonna see the fill of it is gonna change to whatever color I select. The little circle behind it right now, if I click on it, it's gonna to come to the forefront and you'll notice this circle is a little bit higher. This is your line. If I wanted to outline it with something, um, I could pick a color. Now right now it's a white circle with a line through it, which means there is no color here. So now that I have it selected, I could pick any color I wanted and just say like this purple. And so now I have a line color. So again, the circle in the front lower is your fill color. Again, I can change it. If I click on the circle that's a little bit higher, it comes to the forefront, but that's my line color. So you'll see as I do this, the, the, the line changes um, depending on how I do it. And say I didn't like the line at all anymore, I wanted to get rid of it. This little circle in the bottom left corner, the white with the red line through it, if I click on it, now that is gone again. So that's something to know about color um, fills and lines and getting rid of colors altogether. Let's go over to this square here. And again, this one, my fill is selected right now. I'm gonna change that to something else. And let's say I wanted to put a outline on it. I'm gonna click up here. I'm gonna pick a color, maybe this one. Now I can also change the stroke size of this line. So I've got my shape selected. Up in my tool, refine toolbar menu up here, you'll see this stroke option, which shows you the color it currently is. And there's this line on it. If I click on this, I can move this slider bar back and forth to make the line uh, thicker or thinner. Now this bar maxes out at 100, but I want you to know anything you do in Affinity Photo, if you have these slider bars, you can type in whatever number you want here. It just maxes out at 100 on the slider bar. So now I have 200 selected, right? So I can slide that back and forth. I can make it a dotted line. We'll get into all this stuff later, but I want essentially you to know how the colors work and how the, the fill and stroke or line work. Next up, let's start working with some layers. Okay, so next up, we're gonna talk about one of the most important things working with photo editing, and that's layers. Now your layers panel, again, is over in the panel section right here. There's a bunch of different tabs by default, and this is your layers panel. And what we're gonna do is create a shape, and we'll create a few shapes, and I wanna show you how layers work. So let's first go over to our shapes, and I'm just gonna pick a circle out of my tools here. I want a perfect circle, so I'm gonna hold shift and just drag out this circle here. So I've got this circle with an outline. I'm gonna get rid of the outline. So again, let's go up to the color in the top right of our panels here. I've got my uh, stroke or line selected. And I'm just gonna click this circle again to get rid of it. So I don't have it. So what I want you to notice in the layers panel, now I have this ellipse. So you, see, you can see a preview of it and it says ellipse next to it. I'm gonna call this yellow circle because I'm super original. Now, it doesn't mean anything. There's one thing sitting over here but let's draw another shape out. So now I'm gonna go and I'm gonna grab a, a square. I'm gonna hold shift, I'm gonna drag it out. And this one is also yellow, I'm gonna change the color. So I'm, I'm gonna go up here to my color tab, I'm gonna click on the lower circle, cause that's my fill color, that's currently yellow. I'm gonna change it to say blue, right? So now, if you look in the layers panel, now I have this preview of it, and it just says rectangle. So I'm gonna call this blue square. So I have these two shapes here. Now let's add one more. I'm gonna go back to my uh, shapes here. I'm gonna grab a triangle, hold shift, drag it out. And it's the same blue. 
So back to my color and I'm going to make this one different. I'm going to make it red. And now I have a uh, triangle. And actually, also guys, in your layers panel, whenever, whenever something's named, you can just double click on it and just change it to whatever you want. And I'm going to say red triangle. Now here's the important thing about layers. You'll notice right now in my layers, the red triangle is at the top, the blue square is in the middle, and the yellow circle is at the bottom. So what that means, if I grab this yellow circle and drag it, you can see now it's behind the red triangle and the blue square. Now because the blue square is in the middle, if I drag that here, it's now over top and covering the yellow circle, but it's not covering the red triangle because the red triangle is at the top. So you think of it almost like a hamburger or a sandwich, say the yellow circle would be bread at the bottom, the blue square would be, I don't know, some cheese, and the red triangle would be the piece of bread at the top. So whatever's in, whatever's at the top of this layer stack will show at the top. So, and I can move these around. So say I wanted the yellow tri yellow circle to be at the top. I could click the yellow circle, click, hold my mouse, and you'll see these little lines appearing. I can drag it up to the very top. So now my uh, yellow circle is at the very top. So whatever is showing in your layers panel, top to bottom, that's how it'll reflect in your actual composition. If you brought two photos in, whatever photo was at the top of the layers panel would be hiding the photo below it, depending on the size. And again, you can drag these around. Usually this long blue line will show you that you're pulling it uh, in between. And you can just move these around just like that. And again, if I wanted to rename them, rename me, exclamation mark. Uh, you can just click and rename them. You can also turn these on and off so you don't see them by clicking this here. So it's not gone, it's just hidden right now. So you don't see it if you were working with these two shapes and then you wanted to bring this one back in. So this is the basics of layers. This is what makes photo editing and photo manipulation super powerful. But just know, whatever you're seeing at the very top is what you'll see. And as you go down, layers will be stacked on top of each other like a sandwich or like a hamburger or something like that. So that is the basics of layers. Okay, so next up, we're gonna talk about a few different tools in your toolbox. Uh, starting with the paintbrush. Now the paintbrush is really important because it's not just for painting. You're going to be using it for selections and your masks and it's really important to understand how it works. So let's go grab our paintbrush out of our toolbox and you can hit B on your keyboard or you can just select the paintbrush right here. And when I do that, you're going to see my mouse changes to a circle. Now the important things to pay attention to here uh, in your refined toolbar at the very top left, you have your width slider. Now what that means is that can make your brush bigger or smaller. So if I slide it to the right, my brush gets bigger. If I slide it to the left, my brush gets smaller. You can also make your brush bigger or smaller using a keyboard shortcut. If you have a, an English keyboard, if you use your bracket key and you put it to the right, your brush will get bigger. If you do it to the left, your brush will get smaller. It's good to use this if you're kind of working on something and your brush needs to go big and small as you go. The keyboard shortcut really helps. The next thing to pay attention to is your opacity, which is essentially transparency, your flow, which you need to think of your flow as how much paint is on your paintbrush? 100% flow means you put your uh, brush in the bucket and got a lot of paint. If your flow is really low, uh, just think about putting a little bit of paint on your paintbrush and it kind of is blotchy as you're as you're kind of doing a stroke. And your hardness means essentially the if you if you did a, a paint circle like a blotch on a piece of paper, the hardness of the actual edge would be how hard it is. If it's soft, it would be really faded, and if it's hard, it would be really um, defined. And I'll show you what I mean. Your paintbrushes too, by the way, um, are in your, the different, you, you can pick different paintbrushes and by default, they're over in your panel. So you have your layers over here and your brushes are right here. And Affinity comes with a lot um, by default. I just have a basic brush picked, which you would have as well. Um, there's a menu here of all the different brushes I have, but you can uh, install other ones or buy ones or create your own. So let's start um, doing a paint with everything set to hundred, opacity, flow, and hardness. I wanna show you to me what I mean. So I'm gonna do a stroke here and it looks like a pretty solid line. The edges look pretty sharp. Uh, and now I'm gonna bring the opacity down to 50%, which remember is sort of like the transparency. So it should look faded when I paint this. Now it's at 50%. If I do a line, you can see it's, the edges are hard and all that stuff, but it looks faded because it's only at 50%. Now I'm gonna bring that opacity back up to 100. I'm gonna drop the flow really, really low now. And again, remember, the, think of this as the amount of paint that's on your paintbrush. I'm gonna bring this to like 5%. Now when I paint, you should see, see how it looks sort of blotchy because it doesn't have a ton of paint and it's just kind of chugging along as you paint. So that is your flow. Now I'm gonna turn that back up to 100% and now I'm gonna turn the hardness down. Now think the first stroke at the very top is your hardness at 100. Now this is hardness at 15. So when I do it now, you can see, 
that the edges are a lot softer. They're not solid. They're, they're, they're a bit, you know, softer and calmer. And that is what your hardness is. Now you'll be going, you'll changing these back and forth when you use your paintbrush all the time. Um, depending on the look that you're going for. There's no right answer. It just depends on what you're working on and how, how you want it to look. So again, with your brushes, uh, you can hit B on your keyboard to pull up your brush. Your brushes, your different types of brushes are located in your panels over here by clicking on the brushes tab and your width slider will control the uh, size of the brush. Your opacity is your transparency. Your flow essentially is how much paint is on the brush and the hardness means how sharp or defined the edge will be. So that is your paint brush. Okay, so next up, moving along with brushes, I want to talk about the in painting brush tool. Now, the in painting brush tool is basically to remove things out of the photo that you don't want. So, uh, I got an example of these birds here, and I want to remove a couple of these birds. So, let's go over to the in painting brush tool in our toolbox over here, and it is this one right here, and the shortcut would be J. And when you click on that, again, like any paintbrush, you can make it bigger and smaller by uh, messing with the width slider and changing the opacity, the flow, and the hardness. Um, and you can also make the brush bigger or smaller on your keyboard using your bracket keys. So say I want to get rid of this bird right here. Now, something that happens in Affinity Photo a lot, which doesn't matter what you're doing, you always want to make sure in your layers panel to the right, you have your layer selected. If I start painting over here, nothing's happening. And usually I should see red as to where it's painting. And it might be confusing at times to say, well, I'm painting on it. Why isn't it working? Always make sure in Affinity Photo, you've got your layer selected that you want to work on. So Affinity knows which one um, that you're telling it to, to, to work with. So now that I've got this selected, I'm going to try and get rid of this bird. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start painting and you're going to see in red exactly what I want to get rid of. So I'm trying to paint this. I want to get rid of it. Affinity is going to do its best to get rid of that bird. And if you look, even if you zoom in, it's pretty good. There might be a little line here that I want to get rid of. Maybe that's from the bird. I'll get rid of that. And that does a pretty good job. What it does is it pulls pixels and it looks in the surrounding area and says, how can we fill this in without, um, you know, with it making it look normal. So let's grab maybe one of these birds down here because he's in half the water and half the sky. Let's see how it does. So I'm going to paint over this bird as well. And let's see how it does. And that's pretty good. It looks, it looks pretty good. So essentially, uh, your in your selection brush tool, your in painting brush tool, should I say, is used to remove objects, uh, in a smart manner and it, sometimes it can do a pretty good job. Sometimes depending on how hard it is, it's not fantastic. It all depends on what you're working with, but there's different ways to get around it. And anything you can think of, you can do it in Affinity Photo with the right tools. So uh, moving on, that was the in-painting brush tool. Okay, so next up we're talking selections in Affinity Photo. And we're gonna be using the most popular method of making a selection, which is the selection brush tool. And if you're not sure, making a selection essentially is taking a person out of a picture or an object, uh, removing the background, editing into a photo composition, something like that. Uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the selection brush tool to do that. So in our tools bar, we're gonna go over here and we're gonna pick on the selection brush tool, which is W on your keyboard. And this is a brush like any other brush in Affinity Photo. My mouse changes to a circle, but I can make the brush bigger or smaller. And to do that, I can go up to the width slider bar in the top left corner of the refined toolbar. And if I slide it this way, it'll get bigger. If I slide it this way, it'll get smaller. So another way also, which is a quick shortcut here, to control the brush size, any brush in Affinity Photo, is your keyboard. If you have an English keyboard, you can use your bracket keys. If you hit your left bracket key, your brush gets smaller. If you hit your right bracket key, your brush gets bigger. So what I'm going to do now with this is essentially I'm going to start painting over top of this model and Affinity Photo is going to do its best to try and detect her. So if I start painting, you'll notice these little uh, lines appearing. These are called marching ants and they're showing what is currently selected. So if I paint over top of her, I'm just holding my mouse and painting over top. I'm adjusting my brush size a little bit with my keyboard as I go. And it's going to try its best to detect um, her and the contrast between her and the background is pretty good. So this is a basic example. We're going to go into harder examples later. So I'm going to go up, try to get her fingers up here in the top, right? And that selection looks pretty good. One thing to pay attention to is the mode. If you look in the top left corner, there's mode, there's add mode and subtract mode. I'm currently in add mode, which means I'm adding to my selection. So if I was painting and just say, I went too far out here and I didn't want this uh, part of the selection, obviously, I can go back up to mode and this time I'm going to click on subtract mode. And what that's going to do now is start taking away the marching ants. So I'm just painting away again here to try and get the selection proper. So now this selection looks pretty good. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to refine my selection and you can find that option in the uh, refine toolbar menu up at the top here. I'm going to click on refine. And we get this box, this refined selection box. And the first thing I want you to pay attention to is these brushes. 
There's the matte brush, the foreground brush, the background brush, and the feather brush. The matte brush essentially says, paint over top of whatever you think is an issue, and Affinity Photo is gonna try again to fix that. So right now, because we see her hair and by her fingers here, it doesn't look quite right. Down in here doesn't look quite right. So I've just got my matte brush selected, and I'm just gonna paint over top of the areas that I want Affinity Photo to fix. Affinity, usually with hair and stuff, does a pretty good job of correcting it. Paint on here, I'll paint over here. Did an okay job. There's some spots left up by the fingers here, and we will go here, paint over this, try and get this fixed. That's done okay, but not fantastic. And this is actually a good way to point out another brush here. So it's tried its best. Oh, there we go, it got it that time. So now we have a decent selection. One other thing to look at here is the preview box. So right now it's called overlay. So anything you're seeing in red in the background is not selected. Anything that's in color that you can see, it, her exactly, is, is the selection. But you can also see what this looks like on different backgrounds. So I can see what she looked like on a black background right now. You can see in the fingers is not perfect. You can see it on a white background. And there's also one called black and white. And this one is really good for um, hair and fur. So if you're working with hair or you're working with animals, um, whiskers, fur, you can really see these lines in here and it can really uh, show the definition. So it's it's really, really helpful. Um, there's also these um, border width, smooth, feather. We'll go over these later, but this is how you can kind of refine your selection a little bit better. Usually you don't have to tweak them too much, but it does help a little bit. The final thing to pay attention to is the output box selection. There's a couple different options here. I always recommend and I always pick new layer. Now, the reason I pick new layer is it's gonna take this model and just in your layers panel, create a brand new pixel layer of this model. And it also does something called color de decontamination, which means if there was a busy background with a lot of colors, it would basically try to separate what you're taking in the background and try to let there be no bleed over. It tries to basically say, remove any colors as best you can from the background so it doesn't go onto this new model or new selection. So I'm gonna pick new layer. And when I do that and hit apply, what you're gonna see in my layers panel to the right is a new pixel layer is gonna appear. And it's just the model. Now right now it looks, everything looks the same because the old picture is still below that. It doesn't get rid of the old picture. What I'm gonna do is turn the old picture off, which is at the bottom layer here. And now you can see, I just have her. She's isolated and there is no, um, there's nothing else behind her. So I could make her bigger or make her smaller, move her around. Um, I could grab some text and I could type hello. And right now, if you look in the layers panel, the text is on top of her. So if I pull this over top, this will go over her head. If I grab the text in my layers panel and just move it below her, now it's behind her head. So that means she's truly isolated. I could also grab a background. So say I went up to, I wanted to grab a new photo and go file, place. And I've got this one called room I'm gonna bring in. And when I paste it in, it's gonna be on the very top. So I'm gonna paste it in right, say right here. And right now it's got um, everything covered because it's sitting at the top. What I'm gonna do is just pull it right below her. So now she's in this photo, I can move her around and you can edit it further obviously to, to mess with the colors and make it look a little bit better. But that is the basics of doing a selection with the selection brush tool. Uh, we're, well, again, we're gonna do more advanced examples later, but that's the basics of using selection brush tool and pulling someone out and removing the background. Okay, so next up, we're gonna talk about some of the healing tools. And these tools can be found in your toolbox. Uh, if you go over here, mine by default is set to the uh, healing brush tool, which is J on your keyboard as a shortcut. And you'll notice it has the little uh, triangle in the bottom right corner, which means there are more tools in here that are related or similar. In this case, um, these healing tools are the healing brush, patch, blemish removal, in painting brush tool, and the red eye removal. So let's do the healing brush tool. A couple things to point out here when we're using some of these tools. If you look in the bottom left corner, on my computer it says click plus drag to clone selected source. On my Mac, option click to set another source. On a PC it would be alt click. Another thing to notice is you don't want to do any damage to this original photo. You always want to do work non-destructively. So what I do when I'm working with this and the clone brush and a couple other things is you want to go over to your layers panel on the right hand side here and you want to add a new pixel layer. And the reason I do that is because you can do all the work on the pixel layer and then you can turn it off or turn it on without damaging the original photo. So right now I have the pixel layer selected in my uh, layers panel here. The next thing I'm going to do is go up to this top uh, refine toolbar and right here you'll see I already have it set to current layer and below but a lot of times by default it's set to current layer. So if I went to current layer and I started trying to use this tool nothing would happen because it's only reading from the, the blank pixel layer. I want it to read below 
so it'll pick up this picture below so we can edit that. So I'm gonna change this from current layer to current layer and below. So now I'm gonna zoom in. The way this works is I wanna find a, say I wanted to cover this up. I wanna find a patch of skin that I wanna use. So I'm gonna hold uh, option on my keyboard or alt on a PC and I'm gonna set my target to say here. Now you can see that black target has been set right there. Now if I go over and I start to paint over top, it's grabbing that area and fixing that. Again, if I go over here and say I wanted to set it to the target to right here, I'm holding down option on my Mac or alt on my PC. I'm clicking to set that target. Now if I start painting, it's gonna start reading that and, and uh, fixing it there. And I'll turn the layer on and off so you can see that. So that's what it looked like. That's uh, after and that's before. So that's the healing brush tool. Let's do another one. I'm gonna go over back to my tool, tools over here. And this time I'm gonna pick the patch tool. And you see the patch tool in the bottom left corner, it says drag to select the desired patch. So what I'm gonna do is with the select is I'm just gonna click and drag out an area of skin. And you'll see when I do that, it's kind of wherever I'm moving my mouse, it's trying to change it to that area. So if I go over here, it's gonna look like that. It's kind of doing one big patch at once, just like it's called the, the patch tool there. So I'm just gonna click here and I'm gonna set that. So it says click to transform the patch, click outside the selection to confirm it. So I've confirmed that, that change has been made. So that's a change between both of them. And one more we'll do here is the blemish removal tool, which is, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and basically says click to drag to remove blemishes. Now this one here, um, it doesn't have the layer and below. Um, so I'm gonna click on the actual file itself because it's kind of a destructive thing. Um, so I'm gonna go over, I'm gonna go down here, let's say to here. I'm gonna make my brush a little bit smaller by hitting my left bracket key. And I'm just gonna click and start painting. And it's gonna be looking for the certain stuff around it. So it's trying to read what's around here to try to fix it. So if I think this patch of skin looks better or this looks better or over here, I could try to set that to there. I'm gonna go over here, say I wanna change this portion here. I'm gonna click here, and I'm just gonna to try to paint around what I want fixed here. And say I wanna move it like that to repair that part. So that is the blemish removal tool. So that's just a quick um, breakdown of the healing tools. The inpainting brush tool as well, we will go over or we've already gone over. And one last thing I wanna mention, uh, if your studio doesn't look like my studio and everything kind of looks out of place, like I said, you've clicked over here and dragged this out here or something is missing, you can always reset your studio by going up to Window, Studio, Reset Studio, and everything will go back to default. Okay, next up, let's talk about the Clone Brush Tool. Now, the Clone Brush Tool is for, you guessed it, for cloning things, and it is found in your toolbox uh, over here. It looks like a stamp. Um, you can hit K on your keyboard as a shortcut. And a couple things to pay attention to when you're working with this. It is a brush, so all your brush settings matter. So in the top left corner, the size of your brush, the opacity, which is the transparency, the flow, which is the amount of, say, paint on your paintbrush, and the hardness is how hard the edge is, all matter to how your clone is going to look. Now, what I always do is I create a new pixel layer because I don't want to do any damage to the original photo, and it helps me edit further beyond that. So I'm going to click on Add a New Pixel Layer. So I have that. <coughs> Excuse me. Next thing to pay attention to, just like in our previous examples, is if current layer and below is selected. Again, by default, usually current layer is selected. So if you have your current layer selected and you have your clone brush and you're trying to clone, nothing happens because it's only reading from a blank layer. So make sure under current layer, current layer and below is selected. Now I have my pixel layer selected, the new one I wanna draw on. I have my current layer and below selected at the top. And if you look in the um, bottom left corner, it says click drag to clone a selected source option click or alt click on a PC to set a, another source. So what I'm gonna do is uh, zoom in a bit here and I'm gonna hold option down on my Mac or alt on my PC. I'm gonna set, uh, I'm gonna set uh, a spot that I wanna clone from, right? So I could click and do that. What I'm gonna do just to show you as an example here as to why the brush settings are important. In the top left corner, I'm gonna keep my flow opacity. I'm gonna turn my hardness up to 100%. So now I'm gonna option click on his head or alt click on a PC and I'm gonna start drawing him out. So you can see there's a target on his body following him as I'm drawing. So it's cloning him. So it's a clone, it looks okay, but you can see obviously there's a really harsh edge around him, which doesn't make it look very good at all. And that's because the hardness in the top left corner is set to 100%, so the edge is very sharp. So let's get rid of that. Let's do it now with the hardness set to zero. So the hardness is set to zero. I'm gonna put the target over top of his head again. I'm gonna start there. I'm gonna hit option click on my Mac or alt click on my PC. And then 
I'm going to start drawing him out again. And you can see this time that I'm drawing him out, the edge is not so harsh. It's a little softer. So it looks a little bit more realistic. You can obviously edit this uh, further to make it look better, but that's how you set a better clone. Uh, you want to make sure your brush settings aren't set too harsh, so the hardness and the flow can be a bit lower. Your current layer and below is selected, and you've created a new pixel layer. And again, because I've created this new pixel layer, I can move this guy around, I could rotate him, um, and I could clean him up later, obviously. But that's how, uh, essentially how you use the clone brush tool in Affinity Photo. Okay, so next I want to talk about the gradient tool. Now the gradient is a way to blend colors together in background or text. It is located in your toolbox. It looks like this. And you can use G on your keyboard to uh, bring a shortcut up. The first thing I'm going to do is just create a shape and we'll put a gradient within that shape. So in my toolbox, I'm going to go down to my shapes. I'm going to pick the rectangle tool here. Uh, I'm going to change the color to something like some kind of a blue maybe. And I'm just going to drag out a box here so I have something. Now you can see I have a blue box created. I'm going to go to my layers panel, make sure I have it selected. Then I'm going to go over to the gradient tool or hit G on my keyboard. And you can click and drag from anywhere. You'll see my mouse changes to a circle with a little line in it. I'm going to drag from the top down. And you'll see when I do that, uh, the colors, there's a black and a blue. And if I drag this little slider bar in the middle, if I pull it down, it'll give me more blue. If I pull it up, it'll give me more black. Now the way to really control this gradient is in the top left. I can change the type of gradient up here. Um, this is the default one, but I can pick any one of these styles here to change how it actually looks. I'm going to go back to the uh, default one. And then how I change the colors is right here. If I click here, I'll get this little box that'll pop up. And again, this bar represents the same thing. If I pull this way, more black. I pull this way, more blue. But say I wanted to control these colors and I wanted to change this black to white. What I can do is click on this node here. Down here in the color box, I can click on that. And I can just change it to say white. And again, I can control it with this bar. And I can even insert ones in the middle. If I wanted a color in the middle, I could go to insert here, click on that, click on the node, go back to color, and then I could pick another color in there. Um, if I didn't want this node, I could just click on it and hit delete. So that's how you can control uh, your gradient. I can do the same thing to text. So if I add some text right now and I said, hello, I could uh, have my text selected in the layers panel, go back to my gradient tool, click on that. I'm just going to click and drag down a gradient here. And there's nothing selected right now, so I'm not seeing anything. So what I'm going to do is go up to my settings right here, click on that. And I'm going to set the bottom color here, click on the node and set that to, I don't know, maybe like a purple. And I can control that again by doing this. And again, if I want to add one, I can insert a node in the middle. I could click on the color box. I could add another color into that. And that would be my uh, gradient for text. So the gradient tool, um, good for backgrounds. You can add it to text. Um, the shortcut is G on your keyboard. Just make sure whatever gradient you're working on, you're select, you have it selected in the layers panel before you apply the gradient. Uh, that's the gradient tool. Let's move on. Okay, so next up, we are talking about a super important tool, the pen tool in Affinity Photo. Now, the pen tool can be used to make really precise selections, uh, to draw lines. It's really, really precise and a great tool to use. A bit weird to get a hold of, but uh, let's go over that so you can start working with it. So the pen tool is, again, in your toolbox. Uh, it is P on your keyboard. It looks like a pen. And the settings to pay attention to are up here. Now, the main stuff you're worried about is the stroke. So you have your stroke color, the uh, width of your line, and some of your pen setting modes. So the first thing we're going to do, I'm going to go to stroke, and I'm just going to pick a color. I'm just going to pick black, like a dark gray black, so we can see it. If you click on this little bar here, you'll see in real time as I move this slider that the line gets thinner or bigger. So it's basically, you know, do you want a straight line? Do you want a dotted line? And how wide do you want it to be? Again, these sliders, you can always type whatever number you want in here. Uh, it just stops at 100. So I'm just going to pick four, just for now, whatever, five, just so you can see it. And the next thing to worry about here are your pen modes. The ones we're worried about here, we're going to work on pen mode, which is standard. We're going to work on line mode and also one called rubber band mode. And I'll show you what those are. So with your pen, basically what happens is when I click, nothing happens with your regular pen mode selected. It's waiting for me to make a connection. So now I could go here and draw a line. And basically it's saying, okay, you're just drawing out a line. I'm just clicking anywhere to try and finish this line. You'll notice in the layers panel at the very top, there is a curve it's created. So it's created a layer. Once I started using the pen saying, oh, we're creating a separate layer while you're using the pen to make this shape. Now that I have this shape selected, um, I can move it around, I could resize it, uh, but I could also go back up to stroke. I could change the color. 
I could click on the width. I could change this to make it bigger or smaller. And that's essentially just for drawing shapes with the uh, pen tool. The next one on the pen tool is I want to change my mode uh, from pen mode to line mode. And essentially what that means, if I hold shift on my keyboard and click, it's going to draw nice straight lines for me, depending on how I'm drawing them. So I'm just holding, I'm holding down shift, click, click, shift, click, click shift click click and just drawing out straight lines so it's good to have just for drawing out you know if you're underlining things or making something that you want very specific to a grid if you use line mode and hold shift while you're um, drawing them out that'll give you perfectly straight lines and the final one i want to show you with the pen tool is rubber band mode so i'm going to select regular pen mode but i'm also going to select rubber band mode and the reason i like rubber band mode is usually when i'm trying to cut something out or make a precise uh, precise selection is because it shows you where the next line is going to go and I'll show you what I mean. So I'm going to click here. You can see now the pen is showing me where the line is going to go. So I can click here and then it's going to show me. And again, if I click here and hold, it's going to show me, I can drag these little handles they are called Bezier handles to show me where it's going to go. And this is good for making selections because you can make, you know, go around circles or go around edges. And it basically shows you where the pen is going to go the next time you click, which is really useful. I'm just going to draw out a strange shape here, connect that. So that is rubber band mode, which I recommend if you're making a selection. And finally, you're using your pen tool to actually cut things out and make a uh, remove backgrounds, cut out people. Um, so here I have a building and what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna grab my pen tool. I'm just gonna have regular pen mode selected in, in the top here and I'll show you how this works. So I'm just gonna do a really easy quick selection here around this building. So I just want this building selected. I wanna get rid of the, uh, I wanna get rid of the building. Um, or sorry, I wanna keep the building and replace the sky. So the first thing I'm gonna do with my pen tool selected is I'm gonna change the, um, <laughs> the stroke because it was the bright crazy purple, which I, I don't need. Uh, so one point, let's do it like that. And now I got it selected. Now I'm just gonna go and draw around as best I can, as quickly as I can around this building. It's not gonna be perfect. I'm gonna draw around this building. Now I'm gonna close the shape. You always wanna close your shape up. So now that I've drawn all the way around it, if you look in the top left corner, there's two options. There's mask and selection. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit mask and we're gonna go over masks later, but essentially what masking does is it, it kind of hides um, what you're working with or it reveals it. We'll go over that later, but I'm gonna hit mask and watch what happens to the background. Now that I've hit mask, the background has disappeared. If you look at the layers panel, don't worry about how this looks right now. I know it looks a bit weird, but this building now has been isolated. Now really with a mask, like I said, you're just hiding things. So right now I've just hidden the sky. That's all I've really done. Um, it's still there, it's just hidden. And again, we'll go over masks later, um, but now that this building has been isolated, what I can do is put a layer underneath and I could say, okay, I wanna change the sky. So now the sky has been changed on this building. And it's really as simple as that. You can obviously edit this picture further to make it look better. Um, but those are the basics of the pen tool. Again, when you select your pen, you're worried about your stroke, which is the color, how thick the line is gonna be, and what pen mode you're in. And today we went over pen mode, line mode for super straight lines, and we went over rubber band mode um, to go to form around shapes and things like that. And then finally, we use the pen to isolate an object and mask it out and then replace the background. So that is the pen tool. Okay, so now we're gonna be talking about advanced layers. We've already gone over basic layers and we're just gonna do a little bit more advanced so you can fully understand them. There's a hierarchy to them. It's gonna make it uh, very clear in a simple example. And we're also gonna talk about grouping really quick. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just grab some text here. I'm gonna go over to my uh, text panel here, artistic text tool. I'm just gonna drag out and type the word design. I'll make it a bit bigger and then I'll just center it there. And what I wanna do is I'm gonna turn on a texture over here. If you look at my layers panel, I have at the very top, I have the text and I have two textures below it, but these textures are both turned off. So if I turn them on, this is the first texture and this is the second texture. So what I wanna do is I wanna take this first texture and I wanna put this uh, texture inside this text. I want it to look like it's inside there. And it's really simple to do. Um, all you have to do is click on the texture that you'd like or whatever you'd like to put inside. And this will apply to shapes as well. Click, hold, drag, and let it go over top of the text. And now if you look in the layers panel, we have the text on top and the texture below it. This up here is called the parent layer. And this down here is called the child layer. So it's embedded inside the text. It's a child to the parent text. So if I move this around or I resize it, whatever I do, it's stuck inside 
that text. Now, I just want to show you something um, that can happen occasionally, which you don't want to do. I'm going to pull the text back out again. If you click on this, if you look in the layers panel, and I drag it to this square, this thumbnail, you're not going to see anything happen. It's not. It's it's more of like a masking technique. It's not what you're looking for. So just keep in mind when you're trying to put a texture or something in a shape or in text, you want to drag it kind of over top to the right, not in the little square box to the left there. You want to just hover right over top, and then it'll 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 embed inside. So um, now, like I was saying, advanced layers, there's hierarchy to them. So this this one that's below it here. If I turn this texture on, you can see it's not inside the text. It's it's outside. And say I wanted to add this as well because I wanted it to be half of this and half like this inside. If I click and drag this and put it over top of the text, just like I was talking about, now as you can see, there's the parent layer text on top. Texture two is sitting right below it, and texture one is sitting at the very bottom. And because it's at the bottom, you can't see it. You can only see this texture. So if I move this, you'll see it. Or if I resize it, you'll see it. So just keep in mind when you're working with layers, whatever is at the top is going to be seen. If it covers the whole design, that's what you're going to see. So if I move this one up to the top now, and because it's big, it's bigger, it's going to cover the whole design. So just keep that in mind. Uh, layers have hierarchy depending on what's what's at the top and what's at the bottom. So that is the more advanced uh, layers and how things are going to work. So just keep in mind, you always have a parent layer and anything below it is a child and there's a hierarchy to those. Uh, one more thing I want to quickly do is show you guys grouping, which is super easy and really uh, effective depending on what, you, what you're working on. And I'm just going to do it with some example circles here. So I'm going to draw, draw out these circles. I'm going to draw three of these circles. And then I'm going to draw three more circles and make them a different color. Just like that. And the way grouping works is I could go over to my layers panel and say I wanted to grab all three of these circles, these orangey red circles. What I'm going to do is click on one. I'm going to hold shift on my keyboard and highlight all of them. And now that all of them are highlighted, I'm going to right click my mouse. I'm going to click group. And now you can see it's created this group. I'm going to call this group one. And if you click below it, let me get rid of these so these aren't distracting anybody. Let me delete that. All those circles are still in that group. But the cool thing is if now if I move them, all of them go together. If I resize them by grabbing any of these nodes, they all resize together. I'm going to do the same thing up here. I'm going to click on this first circle, the blue one. I'm going to hold shift, highlight all those. I'm going to right click, group those. I'm going to call this group two. And same thing, if I move these guys around, they'll follow each other. If I resize them, they'll follow each other, and they're all now grouped. Um, this is really good if you're trying to you know, move elements or resize multiple elements on the same page. And just because they're grouped, it doesn't mean you can't select them individually. I could still change them. I could click on this middle circle, and I could change the color. It's still grouped. I can still move it around. So you still have full control once you expand your layers. So groups are also they're not quite parent child but they're very similar so the same thing i just want you to see that as well uh, to move multiple elements resize multiple elements super helpful that was advanced layers in groups okay so next up we are going to talk about adding uh, effects to your text and you can add it to shapes as well it's really simple and it can really make things uh, look a little bit more professional so your effects they are located in your layers panel at the very bottom there and it's just called fx so layer effects right here and first we're going to apply it to some text. So let's go over to our toolbox. I'm going to go grab my artistic text tool here. I'm just going to click and drag out and I'm going to type the word hey, exclamation mark. Make it a little bit bigger. Hey. All right, so now that we have this selected, it's picked here in the layers panel, I'm going to go down to my effects tab. And when I do that, I'm going to get this box. Now here are all my options. Um, the options you see that uh, have a little plus or an X means you can add multiple uh, multiple of them. So let me show you what I mean. Let's click on outline first. So I'm going to check the box next to outline to apply an outline. And right now you're not seeing anything because I don't have uh, the radius selected. If I drag this up, you're going to see the color black is selected down here and it makes the outline bigger. So I could click on this and I could change the outline to something different. So let's put it to there for now. And with this plus thing here, I could add a second outline. So I could change this outline to maybe a different color. I'll make it this and I'll make it a bit bigger. Now you can see it has two outlines. This, <laughs> this looks horrendous, but uh, pick some good colors and it'll look good. Um, but that's if you see a plus or an X, that means add one or take one away. So uh, I'm just going to get rid of this one for now because we don't really need it. Uh, another big one people use is uh, inner shadow. And I'll show you what that does. You, you can use these sliders, radius, offset, and intensity to set how the shadow looks. So you'll see now it looks like it's kind of almost embedded 
and you can change the angle of this by moving this angle uh, slider around here, this little circle, to show you which way the angle's coming from. Um, there's inner glow, uh, gradient overlays, outer glow. I'll show you um, outer shadow, that's a big one. Some people like a nice drop shadow on their text. Um, so you drag that out here, make it a little bit bigger, a little bit deeper, and that would be your, uh, your outer shadow. And of course there's a blur as well, um, which you can use to, well, blur it. Um, so this is your effects. This is, uh, I'll, I'll do now something on a shape. I'll show you with the background here. Uh, another popular one is um, the outer glow, which is really cool. I'll pick a bright color so you can see that actually. Drag that up. It looks really cool depending on what you're working with. Uh, darker background, this would look better on. And you can change the blend mode. Um, we'll go over those very shortly, but that's the idea basically of doing effects on text. Let's do some shapes now. I'm gonna go to my uh, tools, my toolbox over here. I'm gonna grab a circle. I'm gonna hold shift and just drag up this circle here. This one has a gradient on it already. Um, but let's go back to our effects at the bottom of our layers panel here. Click on that. And if I added a, um, an outer shadow like this, I'm gonna click on the box next to it. I'm just gonna drag it out. And you see when you do that, it gives it a little bit more life. Um, again, you can drag this around. Um, I should note, you can also hit this offset tool and it allows you to sort of just move the shadow where you want. So uh, if you're looking for something a little bit more offset or a little bit different, you can always click off this offset tool and it'll change where the uh, shadow is coming from. Uh, again, uh, you can do uh, you know 3D effects and, and mess with this, slide this around and make, try to make it look more 3D. Um, your inner shadow, your inner glow, uh, all your options are here, just kind of playing around with and seeing what you like. But your effects tab can make uh, things a little bit more professional. Again, you can apply it to text or to uh, shapes and it is located in the bottom of your layers tip panel and they can be turned on and off. I should also note, if I were to draw another circle out, uh, let's say, and I decided to change the color um, and I, I liked it, but say I wanted the same shadow as this one, I can always go to my layers panel and I'm gonna click on this effects of the one I like. I'm gonna click hold and drag it up to this one and let it go. Now the exact effects that are applied to this shape are applied to this shape. So that's a quick way um, to do that is to copy your effects is by clicking and holding them and dragging them to the layer you want. I'll show you another way how to do that as well, but that is the quick down low on the effects. Okay, so next up, we are going to be talking about your adjustment layers. Now, those are located at the bottom of your layers panel, right next to your effects. They are right here called your adjustments. Now, this is how you can change photos black and white. You can adjust the curves, uh, the colors, all that kind of stuff. And I'm gonna show you in this example here, these, these cute dogs here. <coughs> Excuse me, I got a cold. I keep doing that. Please forgive me. Uh, don't unsubscribe if you haven't already. Uh, okay, so adjustments, let's click on that. So when we click on this, we get all these options. Levels, white balance, HSL. So I'm not gonna go over all of these, but I'm gonna go over some main ones. So let's start with uh, something simple, black and white. So when I click on that, you're gonna see this black and white adjustment pop on top of the uh, layers panel here. Now something we're gonna go over in the next lesson, which is advanced layers. If I just wanna make sure, cause there's only one photo here, right? If I had multiple photos, it would be affecting everything below it. So right now, because we just have the one photo, we don't have to worry about moving this around because it's just affecting the one photo. But now that I have this box, I can basically just move these sliders around to affect how I want the black and white image to look. Based on every photo is gonna be different, but I can move that around and I can just kind of adjust it to how I like. Now, the cool thing about this is, is again, I can turn this on and off Adjustment layers are also masks. They have built-in masks. Now, I don't want to confuse anybody, but um, I just want to show you how powerful this is. Because this is a mask and we just went over them, right now, just assume I'm on my black and white adjustment or any one of these adjustments down here. And I take out my paintbrush and I say, okay, you know what? <coughs> oh, I coughed again. Uh, right now I have a, a mask and right now uh, it looks like it's on and I want to reveal what was there previously. So I can just pa actually paint away with my paintbrush what I wanna see. 
So keep in mind, the really powerful thing about adjustments is you can apply them, but they also have built-in masks. So you can use your paintbrush to remove or add things depending on what you're trying to do. So that's black and white. And again, um, if you don't like it, you can delete it or you can turn it on and off. Let's go back to another adjustment. Let's do uh, HSL, which is hue, saturation, luminosity. And again, you'll see it appear up here. And if I just start moving this slider around, you'll see the colors start to change. Now, depending on whatever colors are in the picture, will all depend. I'm on the alpha channel here. <clears throat> Got to stop coughing. But you can select colors if, depending on what's in the photo and see if you can manipulate manipulate those separately. Um, but this is HSL, and I can reset it if I, if I don't like it. I can delete it. And let's look at some other ones. Black and white, there's brightness and contrast, which, of course, is sort of self-explanatory, but if you're new to it, you know, you can just mess with the sliders to see what those do. And let's do curves, because curves is a, a really cool one, a really, really one to get a hold of it. It could probably have its own topic, honestly. Um, but curves basically control the highlights and the shadows of a photo. And it, I know this looks a bit weird right now, um, but if I grab this bar and I pull it down, the picture will get darker. If I pull it up, the picture will get brighter. Now there's a lot more to it, um, but I'll show you what I mean by it's cool with curves. So say I grab this bar and I pull it down, right? Because I like the dogs, say the dog, I like how the dogs look that way, but the background now is too dark. Now, because this has built in max, I could always grab my paintbrush and I could start painting away to get my original color back. Now it would take some work in this particular photo to do that, <coughs> but always keep in mind with your adjustment layers, there are built in masks, so you can do all kinds of cool stuff. So Adjustment layers, they're all down here. They're non-destructive. You can take them, you can remove them, you can turn them off. Uh, and they have built-in masks, which are really, really powerful for your editing. All right, now moving on to blend modes. Uh, blend modes, again, I feel like I say this all the time because there's so many cool tools in Affinity Photo, but blend modes allow you to blend images together or blend things together um, underneath them and on top of them to make something unique. And I'll show you what I mean. So first of all, your blend modes are right at top of your layers panel here, right in this box here. And these are all your options. And depending on what you're working with uh, will be the blend mode you select. Um, sometimes there's multiple ones that might work really well. I wanna show you the difference between them really quick. Let me go over and grab some shapes. I'm gonna go grab a circle. I'm gonna click, I'm gonna drag it out. And I'm gonna make this circle. I'm gonna go back to my color tab here uh, and let's make it, uh, I don't know, let's make it uh, some kind of a, like a blue like this, sure. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna make a couple copies of these. Again, you can uh, hit Command J or Control J on your, uh, your uh, Control J would be on your PC, Command J or, uh, would be on your uh, Mac. So I've got five circles, they're all exactly the same. <coughs> Coughing again. And each blend mode is gonna make it look different with the layer underneath it. So I'm gonna click on the first circle right here in the layers tab. I'm gonna go up to the blend mode. I'm just gonna change the first one to, uh, let's say, multiply. I'm gonna click on the second circle and I'm gonna change it to, uh, let's say, let's pick overlay. And this one, I'm gonna pick soft light. And on the fourth circle, I'm gonna pick, uh, let's say, divide. And on the fifth one, I'm gonna pick, uh, let's pick color. So you can see, if I zoom in here, how they all react a little bit differently to what is underneath them. So blend modes, depending on what you're working with, can make things like blend in and make them look really cool. Let's get rid of those circles here. I'm gonna add some text now by going over to my text tool. And I'm gonna just write the word blend. And I'll change that again to a different color, maybe something like that. And I'm gonna change the font to something more bold like this. And I'm gonna go through a couple of the blend modes and we'll see what makes it look like it's actually on the brick. So up to the blend modes at the very top, I've got my text selected in my layers panel. And I'm just gonna go through my blend modes. Uh, darken looks pretty cool. Multiply looks really cool. Color burn looks cool. So these darker blend modes look like they're actually on the brick. Uh, the lighter ones, the overlays and the soft lights look okay, um, but not as great. And again, it depends on what you're, what you're working with. So I'm gonna pick, I think multiply. And there's other additional things we could do to this, but for right now, um, it looks pretty good. It looks like that text is on, is embedded on that brick. Again, we can do some additional stuff, you know, later on in advanced stuff to make it a little bit blurry on the edges. So it actually looks like it's spray painted or written on there. And it also works for pictures. So I'm gonna delete that text. I'm gonna turn on a picture uh, of this girl here. 
I'm going to bring her over to the wall like this. And again, we're just going to go through some different blend modes to see what it looks like. So I've got her selected. I'm going up to the top of the layers panel. And if I go through some of these settings, you can see that she will look different on the wall. So in some cases that she's spray painted or drawn on depending on what blend mode I've selected. Now these ones here that I'm selecting now, overlay and soft light are good for uh, different effects you can download. So you get like snow or fire or things like, you know, stars, something like that. Um, again, it all depends on what you're working on. Uh, but if I say in this case went to, I don't know, I could go, let's just say I picked multiply. I could also use my opacity slider here at the top of my layers panel. So I've got the girl selected and I could just bring it down a little bit or bring it up depending on how I want it to look. So that is the basics of blend modes. Just play around with them, find what works, and you can come up with some really cool stuff. Okay, now we're talking about live filter layers, and they are a great way to add effects to text and other things to really step up your design. And live filters are found in two places in Affinity Photo. First place is at the bottom of your layers panel. They are right here. If I click on this, I will get a list of all the live filters. And another spot is at the very top. If you go up to layer, new live filter layer and all your uh, filters are here and the great thing about these is, is they are non-destructive and what i mean by that is if you use either either of those spots i just showed you anything you do you can work on something go do something else come back and always change it get rid of it um, it's always a work in progress so nothing is set in stone now there's a destructive way and a non-destructive way and i want to quickly show you what i mean so if i go down to uh let me add some text first i'm going to go to my text panel here i'm just going to write out the word yeah you guessed it design and I want design to look like it's on the road in front of me. I want it to look flat. So there's a, a tool you can use to do that. And there's a perspective tool. So if I go over to my um, panel over here, my toolbox, and I click on this here, I have a perspective tool right here. So if I click on that, I'll get this little box and I'll have these little nodes on the corners of this text. And that means I can start dragging it down. I'm gonna try to change the perspective so it looks like it's more flat, like it's actually written on the road. So I'm just gonna adjust this a little bit just do this really quick to make it look flat as best I can. So let's say, let's go with that. So I'm going to hit apply. So now it looks like it's on the road and I can do other things. Like I could change the opacity a bit to make it look like it's faded into the road a little bit. Um, and say I thought, okay, that looks great, but you know what? The text could be a little bit bigger. And I think I'd like to uh, change the corner a bit, but I can't actually change it now. I can make it bigger. I can move it around, I can make it smaller, but I can't actually change the perspective anymore. It's, it's not available to me because I used a destructive way of doing that. So let's back up. Let me go all the way back. And this time, instead of using this version that's in my toolbox over here, what I'm gonna do is click on my text. I'm gonna go up to layer, new live filter layer. This one happens to be under distort and it was called perspective. And when I do that, you'll see the box pops up. But if you'll notice now in my layers panel over to the right, underneath my text, I have a perspective um, live filter. So it's showing up in there, which means basically like, hey, if you, you can work on this and when you're done, come back and click on it again and you can work on it. And I'll show you what you mean. So let me, let me change the perspective. So I'm gonna change the perspective on this one. And let's just keep it, let's just keep it. No, actually, no, let me edit it a bit. Let's pull it down a little bit more. So let's just put it like that for now. So, okay, we're gonna keep that and we'll do the same thing. I'm gonna bring the text down a little bit and let's say I went on and did something else. Let's say I just grabbed a circle and I wanted to draw a circle out for some reason and I did that, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, you know what? I wanna go back and change this. What I can do is I can go over to my layers panel, click on my perspective, my box comes back and now I have the option to move this again because it's non-destructive. So now I can edit it again, I can change it however I want, and it's always a work in progress. It's non-destructive. So that is how live filters work. There's a ton of them. Again, you can go down to the bottom right and click on this icon down here, or you can go to the very top and click layer, new live filter layer, and you can mess with them here. Again, they are all non-destructive, so edit them, go back, delete them, whatever you like. Um, but these are the way to work, to do your workflow because you, uh, you won't cause any harm. And that is live filter layers. Okay, so the next thing we're talking about is masking. Now masking is one of the most important elements of photo manipulation and it's super powerful. Basically all it is, once you get your head around it, 
is hiding things or bringing things back in. So you can sort of make things look however you want by showing something or hiding something. And what I'm gonna do here in this example is I have this guy's face here. And if you look in the layers panel, at the very top, I have this guy. And below it, I have this AI robot. So if I uncheck this guy, you see I have a robot's face underneath. I'm gonna use my opacity or my transparency slider here at the top of my layers panel, just to show you I have it lined up sort of like this. And the idea of masking is what I wanna do is hide portions of this guy's face to bring the robot head through. So what we're gonna do is click on the guy at the very top. Now we're gonna go down to our masking button at the bottom of our layers panel, which is right here. And when I click on that, you'll see this white box appears underneath this top layer. There's a little arrow here. And it's this white box and it says mask on it. And the box is, uh, it's just a white square. So just note that because it's a regular mask. Now what I can do is I can go grab my paintbrush. So I can go over to my toolbox here. I can either click B on my keyboard or click on my paintbrush here. And what I can do is, because the box is white, it's showing the mask. <clears throat> now just st stay with me for a second. Now if I go paint in black, I can hide parts of this mask. And keep in mind, this is also, I'm using the paintbrush. So all my settings up here from earlier, opacity, flow, hardness, they all count towards how the paintbrush is gonna make this look. If I start doing this, it's gonna be a hard circle. And you can see underneath now, it's showing the robot underneath by me moving this. But you can see the circle, the edge is very hard there. So what I'm gonna do is just erase that. I'm gonna go back. And by the way, um, to go backwards, you can uh, go um, edit and you can undo. Um, on a Mac, I hit uh, Command Z. I think on a PC, maybe Control Z would, would do that. Uh, and I'm just gonna change the flow and the uh, opacity down a little bit here and the hardness down a little bit. So just so it's not so intense, <clears throat> excuse me. So if I go to his face now and start painting, you can see as I slowly paint, the eye will start coming through. And you think, you might be thinking, okay, great. Like I could use an eraser to do this. But the reason masking is so powerful is because it's non-destructive. So say I did this, let's say I went down here and I went a bit too far and I decided, oh, I don't like that. I've gone a bit too far. All I have to do is instead of painting in black, is all I have to do is go back and paint in white now to basically bring it back. So now, I, now I'm just putting it back in and saying, okay, well, I didn't like that. So now I can just go back. I can adjust my brush to whatever size I want or how, whatever strength I want, and I can adjust this sort of like that. <coughs> so that is the power of masking, hiding things or bringing things back to make uh, the photo composition that you're looking for. One other thing I should note um, is you can start with an empty mask. And that means basically to, to, to have an empty mask, basically you hide it first and you say, okay, you know what, hide it and I'll bring back the portions I want as opposed to a regular mask, which has it showing you and then you can take away from it. There's no wrong, right or wrong way to do it. It's just however you want to start. Uh, the way to do it on a Mac, down in the mask button, if you hit option click, you'll get the option for an empty mask. And on a PC, if you right click on the mask, you'll have an option. So now if I hit empty mask on this top level, this, this man, you're gonna see when I do that, he disappears. And you can see the mask button now is now black because now it's hiding it. So what I would do if I wanted to start revealing him is I would paint in white. If I wanted to paint in black because the box is already black, it's not gonna show me anything. Nothing's gonna happen. But if I go back to white and I start painting, I can start bringing in portions of this guy again just by painting him back in. So that's the idea of masking. We'll do one more quick example, but think of it basically like that. If you start a regular, you do a regular mask, it's gonna, nothing's gonna happen. It's gonna look exactly the same. You're gonna take your paintbrush, you're gonna paint in black, and it's gonna start removing the items that you don't want. If you wanna bring some of it back, you start painting in white and that image will come back. Okay, so let's flip over just to do one more example just to make sure you got your head around this. I have this background and this plane here. And this doesn't look very real at all. There'd be a lot of editing to make this look realistic. What I want to do is make it look like it's in the snow a little bit. And I have a, a more advanced video where I'm doing very similar examples uh, on my channel. Um, I'll try to remember to link it below, but there's a mask uh, video I have, which is more in depth um, that explains all this stuff. But uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a mask to this airplane. So I've added a mask. I went down to my mask button and I clicked on it and added it. And now, because it's showing, what I want to do is paint in black to start hiding it. Now, what I want to do, I'm going to go to my paintbrush. And what I, what I want to do is I'm going to set my brush settings, my flow, my hardness. I'm going to set them really low so it's a gradual sort of fade in here. And what I want to do is I want to hide the portions of the bottom of it to show this background snow to look like it's embedded in the snow. So what I'm going to do is just start slowly 
painting away. And I should note too, the brush that you're using also has an effect on how it's gonna look. So if you go to your brush panel here, whatever brush you're using is gonna have an effect on the way your mask looks. So I'm gonna start painting this away here, slowly. Might make it a little bit smaller too. And I'm just gonna to try to bury this airplane a little bit, just to look like it's actually sitting in the snow. So you can see with your masking, you can make it look, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit better. Um, this isn't the best example you've ever seen, I'm sure. But if I hide the mask, again, you can toggle these on and off. That's what it looked like before, and that's what it looks like after. And you could obviously do some more editing uh, to make this look more realistic. But again, the idea of masking is to conceal or reveal things to make your photo manipulation look exactly how you need. So that's masking. I hope you got your head around it. Uh, let's move on. So advanced selection. So this is still in a beginner's course, so it's going to be more of an advanced selection combining two different tools, but it's um, using these two or one of them, you can pretty much get any kind of selection that you're looking for. Now this model, good contrast between him and the background. The problem will be in between his arms with these shadows uh, for detecting things. So let's, let's first just try to grab the selection brush tool to see how it does. So I'm going to select my layer in the right hand side there. I'm going to go over to my tools. I'm gonna grab on my selection brush tool, which is W on your keyboard. And my mouse is gonna to change to a circle. I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger by uh, hitting my uh, right bracket key. Um, you can also hit your left bracket key to make it smaller or use your width slider in the top left. So I'm gonna start painting over top of this model and it's doing a pretty good job so far of selecting him. And let's zoom in. So we need to get rid of some here, it's been too much. And we need to get in between his arms and add a little bit by his hand here. So I'm still in add mode, so I'm gonna add by his arm here. And let's try to get rid of these portions here. So let's go up to subtract in the top left under mode. Right now we are currently in add mode. So we'll go over to subtract to say, let's get rid of this portion. And I'm gonna click over here to get rid of that. And that's done a great job by his arm. Now let's zoom in here and let's try to get in his arms here because we don't want this part. So let's go in here and say, get rid of all this. Let's go in here and see if we can get rid of that. Okay, so that looks pretty good so far. So now that we have our selection, let's hit the refine button at the top of the toolbar here. I'm gonna hit refine. Okay, so if you look at this now, it looks from here that it's done a pretty good job. You can see by his uh, collar here, it needs to be fixed. Um, his hair looks okay over here. We can do a bit over there. And this looks okay too. Uh, this is a little bit, could be a bit better, but let's change the um, preview and let's see what it looks like. So I'm gonna change this from overlay to white. So if you look at white, if I zoom in, you'll see in between his arms, it looks really, uh, you, there's a lot of over, uh, overlap over here because the, between the shadow and his coat, it's very similar. So it's affinity is having a hard time detecting what is what. So, and if I go to preview mode and I go to black, you'll see it's missing part of his jacket over here. It wasn't really picked up properly. So let's use a couple of these other tools to fix por portions and then we'll do something else. So there's other brushes here, if you notice. There is the matte brush, which we've been using, but there's also a foreground brush. So if you flip to this brush and you paint somewhere, you're telling Affinity, hey, this is actually foreground. Do your best to find this, select it, and use it as my selection. So let's use the foreground brush and let's try to brush over his shirt here. And you can see as I'm painting, it's turning it um, to the correct color, like it's bringing it forward. So I'm gonna paint this much and see how it does. Okay, and if, uh, it's done a pretty good job. It's It's gone a little bit further, I think, than it should, but let's paint a little bit more here. And it's done an okay selection, but it's gone a bit far, but that's okay, we're gonna correct that. Uh, I'm gonna go back to the matte brush here. I'm just gonna go over his hair in certain portions to see if we can fix that. That seems to be fine fixing his hair. So now, this part here is still all in the selection. Let's go back to white so you can see that. We wanna get rid of all this. So there's another brush here called the background brush. So if you paint that part, you're telling Affinity, get rid of this, it's background, I don't want it. So let's see if it works in here. So I got my background brush selected. I'm gonna go in here and just paint over top of this and see how it does. And it's done an okay job. If I go across here, it's doing a decent job, but it's still, unless I got really, really defined, it's not quite perfect. Let's try over here. Is this, where, does it do it over here any, any good? So not bad, it cleans it up a little bit. I could go through with that brush and fix it up, 
but it's not exactly perfect. So let's go back to overlay here. So these are our different brushes. You have the matte brush to say, hey, take a look at the overall picture, fix that affinity. You have the foreground brush to say, hey, this is foreground, this is my selection, try to use this. <coughs> and then you have the background brush, um, which tells it to get rid of the selection because it is just background. So let's use the matte brush here to fix that part. There we go. There's also these sliders here, which I wanna show you. Um, you can smooth it out, you can feather it, and you can ramp it up. But we're gonna talk with smooth and feather. So I'm gonna show you, if I pull smooth way up, it tries to smooth out your selection. And you can see here now it's all gone white around his head. It's gone a bit funny. Uh, smoothing works in certain cases. It really depends on what you're working with. Uh, a lot of times I don't use the smooth slider too much. And there's also feather, which kind of makes your, it kind of softens your selection. I'll ramp feather way up so you can see it. And you can see it has this kind of like glow around him, this kind of, um, sometimes with lights behind people or particular hair, feathering works sometimes. I'll show you under white maybe. It kind of makes it glowy almost, like a bit softer. I'll use an extreme example here because it's just a bit hard to, to get the full selection, right? So they kind of glow almost. So those are those sliders which do work sometimes, but they're not gonna, it's not gonna look particularly crisp or um, sharp. <coughs> okay, so now that we have the selection, it's not perfect, but we're gonna fix it using the pen tool. So uh, let's go down to our output box. And under selection, we're gonna pick new layer because when you pick new layer, it isolates the subject on their own layer and it does color decontamination, which means it doesn't pull any color from the background and tries to make it as clean as possible. So I'm gonna click new layer. I'm gonna click apply. And when I do that, you will see that my new pixel layer appears in my layers panel there. And the checkerboard indicates that there's a transparent background. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a background on this guy just so I can see um, what needs to be fixed. So to do that, it's pretty simple. You can just go up to layer, new fill layer. I'm gonna drag my fill layer to the bottom of my layer stack here, and I'm just gonna pick any kind of color, something to be able to really see what uh, what I wanna fix here. So let's, let's, uh, let's maybe even just keep it white for now. And then I'm gonna zoom in, and you're gonna see around his arms how this isn't perfect. So this is, what, this is how you're gonna fix this kind of stuff. So what we're gonna do is we are gonna grab the pen tool. So I'm gonna grab the pen tool from my tools in the left side here. You can hit P on your keyboard. And the modes are what we want to worry about. So we've got our pen selected. Up at the top under modes, we're gonna select pen mode, but we're also gonna select rubber band mode. So when I click on that, I'm gonna to go to my layers panel, select my model. So I'll rename him the model because he's the one that I wanna use at the very top there. And I'm gonna start going in here and making a selection of stuff that I don't want. So let's go in here. And I, what I'm gonna do is use my pen and rubber band mode is where you can pull your mouse around to kind of make it um, conform to whatever shape that you're working with. So I'm just gonna, it takes a bit of time to work with this and I'm gonna do a quick selection here and I'm gonna move around this jacket. I might speed this up here, but all I'm doing is taking my pen, clicking, dragging, clicking, dragging, and moving my mouse around to get a selection of this jacket. Because what I'm doing is I'm gonna basically isolate the middle of this jacket, which doesn't look good. And I'm gonna say, let's get rid of everything that's in there because all of it is looks a bit messy. Now you could go through with an eraser and try this. You could do it with the background brush, but this is gonna give you pinpoint accuracy depending on how much time you spend doing it. So now that I've made this selection inside his jacket or uh, inside his uh, arm and body there, if you look in the top left corner, I have two options. I have mask and I have selection. We use the pen to isolate objects in an earlier example. This time I'm gonna hit selection. And when I do that, you're gonna see the marching ants appearing around this uh, thing we selected. Now what this means is just this is selected. If I go grab my eraser right now, so I'm gonna to go to my tools panel. You can hit E on your keyboard. I'm gonna grab my eraser. And it's just kind of like a brush too where you can make it bigger or smaller. If I start painting with my eraser, it's gonna start erasing everything. But if I go on the jacket, it's not hurting anything because I'm just erasing what's inside my selection. So now to unselect this, I'm gonna hit Command D on my Mac or Control D on your PC and zoom out. And now you can see how clean it is in there because we've done that selection with our pen. Over here, it looks messy still because we haven't done that portion. Let's go up to his uh, jacket and try to fix this part. 
So what I'm gonna do is zoom in. I'm gonna grab my pen again. So my pen is selected. I'm in regular pen mode with rubber band mode. And I'm gonna start <coughs> at the top of this jacket. And we're just gonna to try to get rid of this as best we can. The colors aren't looking too fantastic up here, but that's okay. So, and now that I have that part and selected, I'm just gonna go out here. Just as long as I can close my shape up, I'm gonna go down here, get all the stuff that I don't want, close that up. This is the selection I wanna erase, so I'm gonna to go to the top left corner, click selection. Now I have my marching ants. I'm gonna grab my eraser, E on my keyboard. And I, as you can see, without me doing it, showing you what it's gonna do. So I'm just gonna erase all this and it doesn't affect him or anywhere outside of the selection. So I'm not doing any harm. So I'll zoom out. So now we have, again, the selection over here hasn't been done yet, so it looks messy. This one over here looks nice and clean. We could uh, do, a, uh, do it over here as well to clean it all up. So that's advanced selections. Start with the selection brush tool, mess with the sliders, use your foreground brush, use your background brush as best you can. And when you really wanna dial things in, use your pen tool. You can do complete selections with your pen tool. Very specific, very targeted if you take a lot of time. Hair is a bit difficult. That's why the selection brush tool is great. But that is advanced selections. I hope it helped. Moving on. Okay, so this is a quick one. I went over this in the very beginning, but just in case, I wanna make sure because um, sometimes it's it's hard to, to, to figure out how to do this. So say I had this logo and I wanted to export it and I didn't want the background to be white. So say I, I exported it, I went and saved it, I, saved it as a PNG, I thought I was doing everything right, and my logo ended up looking exactly like this. I would go to put it on a website or something and it looked like this. Well, that's not what I want. I want it to be transparent. So uh, if you have a document like this and it has a background on it that you don't want, uh, you can just go up to Document, Transparent Background. And then you'll see this checkerboard behind it, which basically means there is no background. The only thing showing is this. So now it, if you put it on a website or something, it would look like this. But keep in mind, you have to have a, an object that, um, you know, if you had a picture and you said, oh, I, I don't want the background, Affinity's not gonna know what background you don't want. You have to isolate the subject that you want or the thing you want. Once that's isolated, then you can make the background transparent. So again, if you have a document and you wanna make a transparent background and just export this part, make sure you go up to document, transparent background, and make, you, make sure you export as a PNG. Okay, so next up we are talking about workspaces. Now I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on workspaces because most of the time you're gonna be in the photo persona. And if you look in the very top left corner, there's these uh, boxes up here. So right now we're in the photo persona. There's also the liquify persona, there's the, the develop persona, tone mapping, and export. Now, again, we spent most of our time here in the photo persona, which is what you'll do most of the time. And I'm just gonna quickly go over a couple of these. Now, the liquify persona, which is right here, if uh, if you click on it, it's gonna change your whole workspace. Now, what I, what I recommend instead of going into this workspace, if you wanna use liquify, is just, we went over in the last video, one of the last videos, is live filters. Go up to layer, new live filter layer, distort, and liquify is right here. And this is the non-destructive way of doing it. This is how I would recommend if you're ever gonna use liquify, do it this way. Next up, we have the develop persona. Now, if you're uh, a photographer working with raw files, it's very similar to Photoshop's raw camera filter, I believe. Um, and if I try to go to this workspace, right now I have an image loaded, okay? And if I, I'm gonna get an error when I do this and I wanna show you how to fix it. So if I click on this and it says, please select an RGB pixel layer before entering develop. And there's two ways to uh, fix that before you can go in. The first way is to go over to your layer on the right-hand side. You can right-click your mouse and you have an option here to rasterize. So you can rasterize it and then it'll let you in. Another way to do it is to go to document, flatten. And if you flatten it, it'll let you do the same thing. So I'm gonna click on flatten. I'm gonna go back to uh, my develop persona. Now you'll see my workspace has changed. My tools on the left-hand side are different. And now I have all these options over here on the right. Um, so I can change things. I can change you know, the, the black point, the exposure, um, the saturation. I have white balance, shadows and highlights, profiles. And I have all these tabs here, lens. Um, so I can do things with the lens. Um, I can, uh, there's details, there's tones, there's overlays. So this is something usually when you're done a photo composition to really make it pop or to really, you know, really mess with it once you're done to really, you know, bring out whatever it is you're going for. 
you would go in the, to the develop persona to do that. So you can develop it or you can hit cancel, it's up to you. But that is the develop persona. Again, for photographers using raw files or uh, anybody who used uh, Photoshop's raw camera filter, it's something similar to that. Um, I'm not going to go into tone mapping. You might play with it. It has some cool stuff in there sometimes, but I don't think you'll use it a ton, especially as a, a beginner. And there's the export persona, which is exporting files, um, which is good for isolating certain layers and things like that. But again, more of an advanced thing. We'll sh I'll show you how to export stuff uh, in a video next or soon, uh, all the basic stuff you're going to need. So that is your workspaces. Again, most of the time you are here in the photo persona, but you can also do some other things in these other uh, workspaces, you know, if needed. Let's move on. Okay, we're almost there. We're pretty much there. We're going to talk about exporting now. So you have this picture. Say this is what your final product is. You want to send this to someone or save it. Um, you're going to export it. Now, there's a couple different ways to export, but let's just go with the most basic, easiest way. And that is to go up to File and then hit Export. And here you're presented with a uh, some settings. Now, you don't have to worry about these settings most of the time. Um, it depends on what you're working with. And here's your drop-down menu, which you're concerned with. So you have JPEG or PNG. Um, I do want to note you can export to PSD, which is a Photoshop file. So the cool thing about Affinity Photo is you can build something in Affinity Photo, export it as a Photoshop file, and someone in Photoshop can open it up. Now, I, I know sometimes text is a bit weird when you open it up in Photoshop, but everything else is pretty much there. It's pretty amazing how it works. Um, so these are all your different file formats you can actually export in. A um, couple things to note is you can change the size of your file here. And this button here means the file sizes are linked. So what happens, I'll show you. Right now it's linked, there it's unlinked. So say I change this file size to 1400. Affinity Photo is going to basically automatically resize this. If I click here, it's automatically resized that to the appropriate size based on what I've changed to. If I uncheck this and I change it to 1800, this size to the right is not going to change. So um, that's just, you know, you may you may use that, you may not. Um, but that's, you know, just wanted to show you that. And you can have presets for the best quality, high quality. Uh, this slider bar is important to see sometimes. So this document right now, it's going to tell you how big it is. It, it thinks it's going to be about 1.62 megabytes. Say so I was like, that file size is a little too big. I can move this slider down a little bit and it'll recalculate and show you the file size. And I can say from experience using Affinity Photo, sometimes you you know, you have a file at 100% and you pull it down to, you know, 95 or 94 and you're like, oh, I don't want want to lose too much quality." You won't notice it. Um, it brings the file size way down and you really don't notice most of the time. I wouldn't worry about any of the advanced stuff for now because you don't need to know that. When everything looks good and you're happy with it, um, you can click export and then your computer's going to say, "Okay, where do you want to save it?" So, I'm just going to pick here and I'm going to say uh, I'm, hello, affinity guy. Okay, I got nothing. Uh, I click save. It's going to save your file and then you're good to go. So again, um, once you're done, file, export, uh, pick your settings. If you're doing something transparent, you're going to want to set it to uh, PNG. If you want to do a Photoshop file, PSD, um, and all your options are there. So that is exporting. We are almost done. You guys did great. Just great. Well, hey, hey, look at you. You did it. You finished. Um, congratulations. Uh, thanks for sticking around. I really, really hope this was helpful to you. I'm sure you understand Affinity Photo a lot better now. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. I read all of them because I don't have any friends. And um, if you like this video, please do me a huge favor. It helps me so much if you can just tap, tap, tap that like button. And why don't you go ahead and subscribe, join the gang, join our gang. Not an actual gang. I put out videos often about uh, Affinity Photo and other great design stuff. So um, thanks so much for watching and I will see you in the next one.